so um, I don't know if I feel comfortable sharing the number, but it was it was something much closer to what my salary was. And he would just look at it and say, huh, why? What does that come from? Why isn't it four times that amount, right? Um, where, where do you want to be in three years? Why? Why don't you think you could do that in six months? Episode 119. This is The Business of Architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Today is the second part of my interview with Anthony Laney, AIA. Anthony Laney is a licensed architect with over seven years of professional experience at respected LA firms, focusing on residential design. And he's one of the husband and wife team that head up Laney LA, a Los Angeles architecture firm. And um, just in terms of these, you talked about, um, Darren, had you do these exercises and assignments that were just so helpful for you to actually get stuff Mm -hmm. done, put stuff down on paper. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the sales process was there. You mentioned a business plan. You mentioned your, uh, your worst case scenario list. Anything else that comes Mm -hmm. to mind that you think is important Mm -hmm. for people that would help Mm -hmm. our listeners out? Yeah, you know, again, as silly as it sounds, some of these exercises were just, um, they would fall under the category of just get it done and iterate later. Meaning, uh, I think that a lot of designers um, suffer from, from a form of perfectionism that can lead to procrastination. And we can certainly tell the difference between good design and bad design, a good website and a bad website. Um, But so much of, I think, success in business comes from just being kind of in front of the pack just enough. And so while I think there was great insight in a lot of the exercises, some of them were as just darn simple as um, put a website up in 24 hours or every morning call five professional contacts, let them know what you're up to and ask them if they can refer you to anybody. These are things that anybody has the, has the capacity to do, but having the personal accountability to actually do it and after a month look back on that progress ha- has been great. So let's talk um, about the business development a little bit. You talked about, you know, how did you get your projects in those, let's say the first couple months? Yes. How did we get the projects in the first couple months? Yeah. Um, One of, so um, again, I think this might be very helpful for, for a young company. We decided early on that it was not below us to not be the prime agreement. And so there are a tremendous amount of consultants, builders, um, folks who landscape architects who have the prime design agreement with the client but just need help. We ended up doing a lot of work for other architects who have great offices who just didn't want to hire another person at a desk full time. And so we filled that niche. We, of course, if somebody offered me, um, you know, a client to do a brand new home, that's what I would get most excited about. But we also felt that we could bring a lot of value to these other offices and professionals who just needed um, a quick, small design exercise or needed us to white label it, meaning be the invisible designer behind it. Um, and because it was a great connection and a great experience, it may not have built our portfolio. I was okay with that. And so early on, we teamed up with a lot of um, architects, subcontractors, hardscape contractors, landscape designers, just providing them with design service very, very fast pace. Um, and that, that helped pay the bills as we were courting these larger, longer prime agreement projects. You, you talked about making business development calls, calling up professional contacts, mm-hmm. letting them know what you're doing, that 
your business coach encouraged you to do that. What have you found to be the most useful or the biggest wins, let us say, the most important things in terms of developing the business? Because I know that's where a lot of early firms From struggle is finding. Well, not just the calls, but that's, so that's one, let's say that's one strategy or one tactic, which is yeah. reaching out to professional yeah. contacts. You know, is there something, maybe one or two strategies or tactics that have stood out to you as being more valuable than others in terms of developing that portfolio of work and being able to bring on new work into the office? Yes. Okay. Uh, two things come to mind. One is how do you handle yourself on that cold call? And, and I just have some thoughts there. And the second is we very strategically made the decision not to um, spend dollars on marketing we kind of decide which projects have the most potential in terms of um, knocking it out of the park with making certain individuals feel well serviced. And so, um, yeah, I can, I can address both of those real, real quick. Um, so when we, when we reach out to our network, when we quote unquote do networking or um, pick up the phone to try to do business development, um, I, I feel that it, it appears very, immature to ask big questions to just say hey help how do I do this who do you have for me we just did not want that attached to our reputation so we think okay who are we calling how can we frame a very very small question that is actually answerable meaning instead of saying hey um, former professor at school um, we launched a company can you help us we say hey um, we're courting this project and we're wondering if you could recommend any students who might be willing to help us on this project. So indirectly, I'm saying I need help, right? But directly, I'm giving them a question that they might feel um, satisfied in answering. And you'd be like, oh, yeah, I'll give you a couple names, right? And so we try to kind of give them a, a pitch that they can really hit. And they can clearly pick up on the fact that we're a young, eager company who's going to take any help we can get. But on the other hand, we want to be just strategic in what are we asking for? Um, people come to me all the time and ask these big questions. How do I do this? And I just think, okay, you need to do more homework. You're asking that question because you haven't done your homework. You need to ratchet that down 10 more bullet points. Come to me with a question that I can actually help you with. Um, anyways, hope that was helpful. Um, I can move on to the next one. <laughs> nice. It was. Please go on. Okay. Um, what was my second one? So we, we've considered investing in House Yelp, the host of, of, of – uh, there's some great magazines here in the South Bay and L.A. that do great profiles. Maybe one day we'll graduate to the level that, that we're in, included in that. For now, though, we will very much kind of in a one-to-one -one say we have a budget which equates to a certain number of man hours – for investing in opportunities, and this is, um, I don't mean to, I, I don't mean to, kind of hurt the profession when I'm doing this. I'm just trying to um, strategically grow who we are. So we might have a client or a potential client, and we might pick up on the fact that whether this is before a signed agreement or while we're in the project, that there's a certain um, design service that they haven't yet hired us to do that that represents a extreme amount of value to them. And so we might just do that in good faith, right? And we found that being strategic in um, looking where can we provide extremely high value design service um, apart from the traditional workflow of an agreement, we found that that has produced glowing reviews. That's been the thing that's introduced us to other clients because we're we're kind of giving a gesture of goodwill saying we're picking up on, on something that's important to you. We can see that we can fill this niche and, and just, just because we want to, we believe in what you're doing. We want to get behind it. And so, um, we have a budget for, for, for that. It's not big, but we do intentionally invest in those sort of, um, um, kind of, <laughs> I don't know what you call it, um, but it's it's that that's what our marketing looks like. Is it a the second one you mentioned? Is that a value added service? Would that? W yeah, I like that a value added service. Mm -hmm. And can you give me an example of what that? What yeah, that might be? so 
So um, in a in a recent project, um, in a recent project, we we were contracted to do um, this landscape design um, for a very high end client, and we in that design process truly felt that a small piece of architecture would um, really make the project sing in a very special way. Let's call it a cabana. So we decided to assume a little bit of risk. We said, the client matches a profile we like. The team is the team we want to stick with. Um, we have the resources to pull, to, you know, do this without even asking permission. We want to, we want to add that value. So we presented at a design meeting everything that they expected and then we pulled out of our bag this extra. And they could have hated it. They could have not liked it. That's the risk we assume. But they loved it. And have since we've gotten three jobs from that where they, they just rave about us. And, um, and so we're, we're always looking for those moments. Awesome. Well, Anthony, you know, anything else that we should be touching on here? Let, let's talk about critiquing the assumptions. That was the second thing you mentioned. The first thing was the exercises mm -hmm. and assignments. You said that Daryl was really good at helping you critique your assumptions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there anything, anything Again, there that we haven't touched on that we need to bring up? What is an assumption yeah, that you made so, that mm -hmm. had to be critiqued? I, I had a certain assumption about how much money I would, wait, I would make, right? What my cash flow or my run rate would be. And what was that? And so um, I don't know if I feel comfortable sharing the number, but it was, it was something much closer to what my salary was. And he would just look at it and say, huh, Why? What does that come from? Why isn't it four times that amount, right? Um, where, where do you want to be in three years? Why? Why don't you think you could do that in six months? And so um, I felt I probably had some baggage just from being the world's greatest employee. That's, that's kind of the, 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 the sh I was so comfortable being that role. Um, I needed someone with some authority to help kind of shake that out of me and not say, Anthony, you need to be making more or less money. It was really just like, where are you getting these figures? And I was like, oh yeah, there's no calculation behind that. There's no logic behind that. I'm just, I'm just putting these limitations on my company. And so he helped me, right? Very, very much psychology, just strip those away. Okay. Let's start from logic. Let's, let's do a, let's do a spreadsheet that, that has, two or three scenarios of projections. Let's start there. Um, and um, I suppose I could have read a book to do that, but there was something about there being a gentleman who I trusted and respected who could say something very abruptly to me that caught my attention and helped me to, those were the assumptions that, that I had to kind of unpack. Interesting. So don't undervalue yourself and don't let your limiting beliefs limit what you can do. So I would say that probably applies to 90% of designers. And I would just add to that, um, ask, you know, somehow these hyper-creative professionals, and I think we're in that category, spend so much love and creativity in design, but for some reason, and we're so good at critiquing assumptions and design, but we fail then to pour that same amount of love and hyper-critical thinking and process to our business and entrepreneurial plans. And that was just like the click for me. It's like, I need to pour my creativity into both of these categories. So what's in the future for Laney LA? Yeah, so we, we've recently decided that we do want to grow. We've been interviewing. We're in the process of hiring. Um, I've gone, the last 18 months, I've been like a hyper freelancer where my fingers touch every project. We're doing about 20 projects. We work very, very fast. Um, and we work very, very hard. And now we're in the transition of um, deciding that we do want to bring on full-time staff. Um, I don't want my fingers to be the ones doing it. And so we are trying to cultivate talented designers, um, kind of at a project manager architect level, as well as the junior designer level, um, so that I can move more into coach, critiquer, studio leader, and um, hopefully increase our influence. How about the transition from the digital team to full-time, how do you see that transition happening and how are you, I guess, mitigating the risk of, you know, just making that leap? That's a tough leap to make. Yeah, it is. And I, 
you asked that question of a of someone on on the podcast a few weeks ago, and I, my ears perked up. Um, I would say we have a very simple answer. We we save our money so that we can do it. So I'm right now putting away cash every month so that I can guarantee that for six months that person's salary is not going to be touched, right? And so I feel like if I had a family, I would want to know that my employer took that, you know, had that level of respect for my salary. But also it's very realistic that it, it takes people time to catch up to speed. It's hard to come out. I mean, uh, we're going to do our best to come out of the gate swinging and, and to have these folks be profitable from day one. But I don't want to put that burden on them. So I feel like I'm, I've, helped, I've started to look at hiring less from what do they cost and what can I get from them and more of how can I deploy this capital in order to bring back a return. And so I think of it more, how can I deploy six months of, of capital into, into an individual and how can they bring me a return for our company? And that I think is very different than just saying what's their rate, what's the client willing to pay um, because you could also critique, is that the best use of that capital? Would a piece of equipment or a piece of real estate um, that is the equivalent of a six-month salary be appropriate? Um, so um, we work very hard and, and are financially frugal so that we can deploy capital with hires. Um, and I'm confident that in far less time than six months, we'll be seeing a return on that. You know, that really ties in well to the third thing you mentioned here, which was uh, that that Darren helped you with your business coach, developing that vision, having mm. a future vision of the company. Mm-hmm. So, would you share? You know, it kind of ties into my question of where's where's Laney LA headed. Would you share with us your vision for where you guys are going? Yeah, um, um, I'm hesitating a little bit because um, it's a little bit polemical. I again, I I love this industry and many of the cultures that come with it. But what drives me at my core is I think there's a better way to do it. I don't think our industry has a good reputation for treating its young very well. Um, And so I have a, um, I think other professions do that a lot better. Um, And so my vision kind of medium term is to create a studio environment that truly does not put a ceiling on the talent of emerging professionals. I want to be that studio that people say that group is young and excited and, and you know, young future architect. If you want to find a spot where they're going to pour into you, go there. And so my vision is, again, to create a studio that really fosters emerging talent um, as a opposed to putting ceilings on it. And I know that sounds like critical and people are going to make assumptions about what I mean by that. But um, I, I do think archi- the architecture industry can treat its young better. And we will benefit from having a, a young generation of designers who have been poured into. And it's not a sink or swim sort of thing. <laughs> um, I, I want to layer on top of that just a conviction um, to to just... I, I think serve others. We um, we have a pro bono kind of division. That model right there is a school we're working on, um, and I think my wife and I share a conviction that that we do want to spend ourselves on behalf of things worth investing in, and and so there's that's there's a degree of service that comes with that. So hopefully that all ties up into serving those who work for us. And serving those who we work for, and um, that's kind of the target we're aiming for. And thanks for bringing that up. And don't hesitate about that. I know you said that. You know, I'm kind of hesitant here because people make assumptions, but it is something real that happens in the profession. You know, I talked with yeah. uh, Art Genser recently, and he had a very one end of the spectrum goal where his main goal was to help his people grow, and he as a leader would take a backseat mm, and really develop them and make them find their place. Um, on the other hand, I was talking to another gentleman who was telling me about an interview he did with um, I want well one of the star architect firms, you know I won't name him, but one of the biggest in LA. And he was sitting here talking to this architect, and and the architect was saying how he did this and he did that and he did this, very egocentric. 
And then behind him was a room of like, you know, 200 basically <laughs> laborers sitting behind their desks, you know, doing shipboard <clears throat> models and, and everything. And, um, and this guy I was talking to said, well, don't, you know, kind of trying to hint, don't you think this is a team effort? Aren't these other people responsible for the end results? And, and so, I mean, that, that could be one example of s- some of the way that people, some people choose to run their firms. Right. And our industry has made the assumption based upon the excess of some that you, you can have one or the other, that I can't tell you how many times I've, I've heard young folks articulate, well, I could go a place that takes care of you and pays you, or I can go a place that does critical, thoughtful architecture. And I'm just like, my eyes are like popping out of my skull. Like, are you kidding me? Like, there's got to be a better way. Right. And, um, those firms do exist. And, I've worked for some of them and have benefited, but I do feel we've, we, we have a ways to go <laughs> in terms of, um, um, yeah, like, like uh, Art said, in, investing in, in those who, who make it possible. Well, and it's very much a cultural conversation. So at the highest level, what mm-hmm. you've just told us is a culture that you want to foster in your own firm. Can you bring mm-hmm. it home a little bit and talk to us about some of the ways that you would implement and make that culture a reality? in your firm? What things mm. would you specifically do differently that would allow someone to feel like they were empowered, to feel like they could, there were no, there was no ceiling on their growth? Yeah. Yeah. So we talk, I would just, part of it is having um, very explicit conversations about the balance between what, you know, young employee are your existing skill sets and how can you bring value to the firm profitability and what are skill sets that you do not yet have that we're going to have to bring value to you and we're going to find that right balance where um, you're neither a burden nor we're neither sucking you dry. So finding that equation is important. I think the other has to do with brand and visibility. Are we the face or, or is the team the face? Are we open to being upfront about who gets credit for this when we, when we, you know, do something that's being celebrated. And so, uh, yeah, I think part of it is just logistics in terms of investing in, in elevating the experience and the talent of our young. And the other has to do with, do we need to put a fence around authorship and, um, and be exclusive in both the credit and the design process? So how would you not put a fence around authorship? So we, um, I, again, I don't know why, it just comes so naturally for my wife and I to hold these large design charrettes. We we, we call them all hands where everyone's there, everyone's throwing ideas, and we may have more experience in this, but I feel like maybe for some people, like it has to be an intentional thing, like, like try hard to value other people's ideas, but it really do, it does come naturally to us. We, we, I think, just come from a culture of wanting to be inclusive and wanting to hear from everyone, from the young designer to the client to the consultant to the contractor, and, and that just comes naturally to us. And, and as natural as that is, that's not how most firms operate. And, um, and so we want to embrace that as, as the way we do it. Anthony, one last question for you. If you could go back in time and talk to yourself 18 months ago or perhaps two years ago, what would you tell yourself mm. about the business and about what you know now? Hmm. Um, I would say um, if I could do it all over again, um, I would somehow want to tell my younger self that more risk and more responsibility doesn't m- need to mean more anxiety. Um, I think that I've learned just to grow comfortable with risk is just risk, and that's what it is. And um, a strategy may be may work and it may not work, but I've learned in the past 18 months how to not let that translate into more risk equals more gray hair. Um, And so I know that's probably an impossible thing just to tell someone and have them implement, but I would, I would really want to attempt to do that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, okay. Now I said, I said one last question, but now I have to follow up. As many as you want. (laughs) I just have to, I just have to ask you, what are the strategies that you use to reduce that anxiety? 
Um, right. Um, what are the strategies I use to reduce that how, anxiety? How do you do okay. it? Because, yeah, think, you talked about how you want to, um, you would tell yourself that, you know, you can take that risk, but you don't, it doesn't need to translate into anxiety. So I'm just trying to get mm -hmm. at if you have some, you know, how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have many, I, I don't think I'm going to have a satisfying answer in terms of like, literally what are the steps to accomplish that? I think for my wife and I, it just has to do with, I think our worldview and our perspective and, and knowing that, um, this could fail and that's okay. Meaning the Laney LA design studio could do something to incur so much risk ability that it could have to close, but that's okay. Um, there are other things that we value that would still be in place. And I think early on, I have a hard time articulating that. I've got two young kids. Um, and so there, you know, it, it, there was some, I think the, the pressure felt very high and looking back, it has all worked out. And right now we are making moves to grow and are assuming even more risk. But I, I feel like now I'm at least in a spot where it's saying, you know, we're going to try it. And if it fails, it fails. And that's okay. Um, I can always um, go to plan B. And so often now we articulate what is plan B and are we okay with that? Yes, we are. Well, thank you. So Anthony, cool, thanks. Anthony, uh, Anthony Laney, yeah, thanks for being on the show. Anthony Laney is uh, one of the owners of Laney LA, and he's a licensed California architect, just talking with us about his coming up on two years of business here uh, out on his own. Mm -hmm. So go check out his website, Laney.LA, that's L-A-N-E-Y dot L-A. Thanks, and we um, are active on Instagram. Is that okay for me to plug it? That's that's where you'll see our new stuff. So Instagram.com slash Laney, L-A, Inc. L-A-N-E-Y, L-A-I-N-C. And so we, we enjoy um, kind of sharing what we do real time and are hoping more architects will do that too. <laughs> so everyone go out there and connect with Anthony on Instagram. Show him the power of the business of architecture, uh, the group we have here that you are listening, that you did value the, the information. He took time out of his schedule today to talk to you and to share his experiences so I think it would be proper for you to uh, reach out to him and just let him know what, what this meant for you. So Anthony, thanks again for joining us today. Yeah, my pleasure. A lot of fun. And if there's any young designers out there who feel like shooting off an email, asking questions, I do enjoy that dialogue tremendously. And so um, you'll, you'll find all our information online. I'm available. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.